Good afternoon. And we are here again for our study. And I am just excited about Galatians. I love Galatians. I love the word of God. Let's pray now. Father, in the precious name of Jesus, thank you for your loving kindnesses and the great multitude of your tender mercies. Thank you for being our father and being the lover of our souls, the bishop of our souls. Thank you so much for your word being true and being faithful. I pray now that you would teach us and lead us as we study tonight. And Father, I pray that we would not walk in the, the uh, way of error, but always in the way of wisdom and righteousness and truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Well, I'm still here at school. And I'm trying to get this done and um, get some rest. Easter is coming up. It is the resurrection. And we are celebrating, we'll be celebrating the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and our uh, freedom from sin and the law. Do pray for me. I have an eye infection and um, can't focus too well, but I'll be okay. All right, here we go. Here we go. Galatians chapter five. Now, I, I tried to finish chapter four last week and I could remain there, but I I'm thinking I'll just wait and do a more extensive series on some of these later. But right now we're just kind of getting an overview, but we'll come back. There's, there's always more that we could do, but we're on to chapter five now, and we're still talking about the law just a little bit. All right. Verse one says, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty where Christ has made us free. Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. All right, in the freedom then with which Christ did make you free. And Paul is talking to, and I guess I didn't bring this point out. Now, we study Galatians, Romans, Ephesians, and certainly those books were not written, those letters are not written to us. Well, we weren't here, so how could they be written to us? But we can identify spiritually with the theme of these uh, letters that Paul wrote. And the um the examples that he gives the analogies that he gives we can uh, pull from them spiritual wisdom and spiritual gems and the word is fresh and it's relevant god gave it to him because he knew it would be used for future generations so there is an argument out there well that was written to the galatians that was specifically to them well it was specifically written to them but it is certainly good for us today and um, I don't I don't understand why people get off on these tangents uh, ridiculous. So I think uh, somebody said to me when I was younger and I was going to college, why are you going to college? You don't need to go to school to preach. My, my pastor ain't never been to college. Um, and I'm like, but we 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 use it as a tool to learn, not only just to learn scriptures or to learn music or learn science, but to, to round the person out. And um, he's like, you don't need to read, just need to read the Bible. That's it. Well, just like God inspired men to write the Bible back then, those days that are past, he inspires men to write today. And the argument is that some have said that these books are old. They're just history. They're no good. And they were written by man, so it's corrupt. Well, the Lord gave it to us just like he gave us Jesus. Jesus had to come in the flesh because if he had not come in the flesh, he could not have redeemed us who were in the flesh. So God gives men inspiration through their intellect, through their experiences, through the unction of the Holy Ghost to write to us. And some things, um, I don't, I hate to, I don't want to degrade the scripture. I don't want to debase the scripture. But some things are, tint, are tainted by our frailty. Some things are colored by our own experiences and our own, uh, our own. I don't want to say our own theology, but you understand what I'm saying. We hear it and we express it the way we, the best way we know how. So sometimes those things come out and they're not as celestial as you want them to be, but we cannot, it cannot be on that platform. Otherwise we'd have an excuse for not accepting and not believing and not trusting. So 
we, we will definitely study that together, study all of these books together. There are many things, things that we will never, uh, there's so much here for us that we will never be able to receive it all before we transition to the next life. Okay. So Paul was speaking to the Jews when he talks about the law, because again, Jesus, Jesus had died and the gospel was being spread. And they were talking about his life and his resurrection and what he, the message that he preached. So now there's the question, well, what do we do with the law? And so this is why Paul was instructing them in Galatians, in 1 Corinthians, and also in Romans, telling them, listen, the law is done. It is done. It did not, it could not bring us salvation. All it could do was point us out to our own human frailties and to show us that we needed someone, a uh, power greater than ours to get us out of this mess that we were in. And I, I still, uh, I just hear people talking about doing this and doing that. And they think that they are pleasing God and they're not. He is not interested. The, the law, and I hope I'm saying this correctly, but the law did not please God. It was not meant to please him. It was meant to show us that we need him. What pleases God was the sweet aroma. David said, let the lifting of my hands be as the evening sacrifice. Let the lifting of my hands, my worship, be the worship or be the sacrifice that uh, is sweeter than and better than the burning of an animal. So David said, even then, they was like, Lord, you really don't want the burnt offerings. You don't want the animals slaughtered. What you want is us. And you want our worship. You want our praise. That's why David was such a praiser. He understood that. But the law was given because of our the evilness of our heart and the arrogance. Of, oh, I'm good. I'm okay. And God was saying, let me show you. Let me show you. All right. So he said it was our schoolmaster to bring us to the place so that we could receive faith. Seeing then that God would not count um, our sin against us if we just believe. Abraham was the example. Well, Abraham believed God. It was accounted unto him for righteousness. He was given a right standing and a place with God. And this is what Paul is trying to get through to the Galatians. But they're tussling. They're back and forth. And I mean, by all means, by all rights, they would have been. Because the law was what they were brought up in. They were, they were under that schoolmaster, that taskmaster. And now they're saying, what do we do? Because when you give freedom sometimes... People are like lost because they're not under a yoke. And they're like, I don't know what to do. And one of the saddest things I think, other than sin, is that when people go to prison who, um, you know, even if they have done something wrong, when they go to prison, they come out after 10 years or 20 years, you know, if they do 30 years, they come out and they have a prison mentality now. And their whole life has been ruined because now they're on that schedule. They're on that, that they're thinking that, you know, I got to go to bed now. I got to do this. I do that because it's ingrained in them. And that's the worst thing in the world because now they have a prison, but it's without bars. But anyway, so Paul was trying to say to them, I know you've been in the law, but now you're free. So we're in Galatians five. He says, uh, stand firm. Uh, one translation says Christ has truly made us free. The law didn't make us free. There was a bondage to the law. And I'm and again, I'm not bashing the law. I'm not beating the law up. I'm just saying it has served its purpose. Okay? If you're coming to visit me and you're going to take the Greyhound bus, the Greyhound bus will only take you to the Greyhound station. That is that is the extent of the duty of the Greyhound bus to take you to the station. It's up to me now. Or it's up to you to get a ride to my house by taxi or calling me and say, hey, I'm here. But the bus cannot take you to my house. You say, well, yes, it can. No, it will not take you to my house. OK. So the freedom that we have in Christ, Paul says, stand firm in it. Stick with it. Don't don't let anybody tell you 
but you got to go back. You know that you've been made free. You, you feel the difference. You know the difference. You understand the difference. And I heard someone say, and this is so true, you can't understand Christ. He has to be revealed. You can't understand God. And if you're trying to understand God by your intellect, you will miss him every time. He has to be revealed to you. All right. So he says, don't be entangled again with that yoke of bondage. Don't go back to the bondage of the law. Don't go back to I got to do this and I got to do that. I got to remember that I can't do this. Like I remember I can't do that. He says, don't go back to that bondage again. Uh, let me see. All right. Nap time. So he says, the benefit, I'm trying to read and follow my notes. Listen, here's the benefit of, of, of salvation, of grace. The benefit is that we have freedom from the law. And that's hard for us to understand, perhaps, because guess what? We've never been under the law. There are some denominations now who teach that Levitical law. Um, but on average, as Gentiles, we were never under the law. So it may be hard for us to understand the transition from the law to freedom in Christ. All right. Uh, so now. Uh, verse two. Behold, Paul, I, I Paul said unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. So there are some people who wanted to accept Christ. They wanted to believe in Christ. They wanted to follow Christ, but they were legalists. So we got Christ, but we still got to follow this law. And I think it was in chapter one, he says, you know, you were set free. It received you the spirit of faith by the law. There's freedom by the law, justification by the law, by the spirit. And so people were saying it's okay to be saved. It's okay to accept Christ, but you got to be circumcised. Now, if I'm being, Paul says, if you become circumcised, now you're taking yourself back to the law and you have to follow the entire law. Now, in the modern world, we circumcise for health reasons. But they were doing it because they were saying this is a sign to God. This is a, this is a, um, this is to help your freedom, your, your salvation. All right. So now if you do part of the law, you are obligated to all of the law. Okay. But if you profess faith in the gospel and you're seeking to be justified by the law, you have said that Christ's death on the cross is inadequate. Jesus did not come to add to the law. Unknown caller. He came to end the law. This is it. You can go no further, he says to the law. You've done your job. Thank you so much. All right. If you got to mix Christ and the law, then Christ is inadequate because salvation needs no help. If you believe for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That is it. It is not. He, the scripture does not teach us to believe and follow the law. It does not instruct us to do that. Okay. So Paul says in verse three. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised. Now he's a debtor to do the whole law. If you go through that ritual, you got to take them all. For we, verse five, through the spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. The expectation of the benefit of this present righteousness. We are waiting by faith to receive what God has promised. You got to be righteous. You got to be holy. Let's say an old church. Okay. Um, and so the only way we're going to get it is by faith. And so we wait and we hope in faith. We hope by the spirit and we hope in the spirit so that we can receive this by faith. All right. Um, I missed something. Oh, I'm sorry. Christ, if you're circumcised, it says Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever 
of you are justified by the law, now you are fallen from grace, right? So he was not describing a loss of salvation, but he said, if you sought justification by the law, then you could not be saved by grace. A person that does that has fallen from, he has, uh, in the sense of leaving behind grace as a means of salvation, so they would not be saved. If Listen, if you don't believe it, then you can't receive it. Are you with me tonight? You got to believe it to receive it. All right. Okay. So now we through the spirit are waiting for the hope of righteousness by faith. Verse six, for in Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith with worketh by love. Jesus came so that we could be ushered into faith. And the father showed us in the Bible, we call the, the law of first appearance. Okay. So Abraham had an opportunity to talk with God and he did. And Abraham believed God and God accounted it to him as unto righteousness. This is the law of first appearance. Abraham believed and he received. So that means that from that point on, everyone who believes will receive salvation through righteousness. And that that was granted to him way before the law, hundreds of years before the law. Definitely was, was more than 430 because Israel was in uh, each of 430 years. So it was years and years and years and years before a law even came. And look how God moved in the lives of his people from Abraham to Isaac, to Jacob, to Joseph. They trusted the father and their relationship with him was by the faith of their father, Abraham. They believed God just like Abraham did. Now for them, as for us, we needed teaching. We needed a revelation of God. We had to reciprocate. In other words, God gave it. Now we got to receive it. We got to do something. Okay. Verse seven. <clears throat> Excuse me. You did run well. Hmm? Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? Hmm? I got a wonderful commentary. I love it. I love it. Now, he's saying, I'm giving you the proper course. This is not legalism. And, and believe me, in our churches, we have our own form of legalism. And um, I hate, I hate the fact that some churches, some denominations vote for people, you know, they, they, the deacons or the trustees or whomever, they vote and they can say, we want the pastor, we don't want the pastor, we want this person, not that person. I really don't like that, but I do know it's needful, not against it, I just don't like it. It is needful sometimes. There, there should be an oversight. No one person should have the total authority because power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So we need we need a check and balance. I, I'm, I'm all for that. But um, Paul says here that we got we cannot trust in legalism to be our salvation. And I've heard people say, God ain't in this and God ain't in that. And I'm like, no, he's not. And what you're saying is, and, I, and I'll give you an example. Let me give you an example because I don't want to pick on anybody. But um, let's take the communion table, all right? So I remember uh, when Fred Price, when the first time I saw Fred Price, my mother was watching it. And Fred Price was talking. He was walking around his church, and he sat on the communion table. I said, oh, my gosh, he's sitting on the communion table. That, it, does anybody have a problem with this? He's sitting on the communion table. 
we have designed. Now, you do know that when Jesus had communion with his disciples, that um, there was no etching on it says in remembrance, you know, doing remembrance, whatever it says. Well, first of all, that wasn't the case. And secondly, it was a table. They sat at that table and ate on a regular basis. It was just a table. And so now in our own legalism, we have sanctified that table. So you can't, if you touch it, you know, this is something bad going to happen. No, it's going to get unconsecrated. No, we don't even sit around the table. We just put juice and, and bread on it. That's it. And I'm not trying to disrespect anybody or, you know, again, what they have going on in their particular church. But there are some people who respect the communion table, but don't love their brothers and sisters in Christ. They respect the communion table, but they don't give an offering ever. They respect the communion table, but they don't trust their father. But they will, you got to follow that protocol and, um, you know, and I hadn't heard this until I was much, much older. But um, I know one church, they if they have um, bread and wine, and they have what they call the feast or something, not the feast of first fruits. They did some kind of love feast. And um, after um, the love feast, if there's bread left over, they have to go and bury the bread. I'm like, oh, legalism. Okay. They're not going to hell for it. I'm not saying tear down the church because of it, but the things that we do, excuse me, the things that we do and we attach them to Christ. No, no, because there is no help to salvation. Either Jesus is all or he's nothing. And I think I remember I told you about all or nothing. If you say something is all, then that means there's no some. If you say some, then there's no all. So you cannot make a statement about all and then give a caveat saying, oh, yeah, but this is the exception. Jesus is all. He's everything. He is salvation. He is our righteousness, our deliverer, our healer, our way maker. He's all of those things because he needs no help whatsoever. Okay. So Paul says, you heard the gospel. And you perpetuated the gospel and you were growing and seeking and learning and, and trusting God. And then you let somebody come along and say, oh, that's great, but don't forget to do this. And now you have these thoughts. Oh, so I should be doing this in the law and I should be doing because you, what is it you find in the law that is righteousness? There is no righteousness in the law. All right, thou shalt not kill. Is that righteous? It is not righteousness, but it's just something you shouldn't do. Hmm? Okay, so now, because you have to remember, if you if you start labeling things in a legalistic manner, you're gonna always leave somebody out. Okay. So um, how can I make an example? Um when you start saying, okay, for instance, when I was growing up, that the women were not supposed to go to church without stockings. Okay? So now, this is a part of your salvation. It's the first Sunday. You see she ain't having no stockings? Lord, the saints just ain't like they used to be over stockings. All right? So now, you've, you've made a part of salvation and righteousness a pair of stockings. Okay? Which... By the way, most people don't wear them. And I'm like, ooh, I'll be cringing. But I realize it's just, it's not, it's not salvation. It's not salvation. All right. But what if someone can't afford stockings? Oh, everybody can afford stockings. Well, I've never, I've never had to buy stockings, but there have been some days that I couldn't get gas. And there was no need to be worried about stopping by McDonald's, Burger King, or wherever. I mean, when I say I had no money, I had no money. I remember one time my mother came by my house and I had been out. I don't know if I had been home the last couple of days or maybe maybe I just got up and went to work that morning. But I came home and my lights were off. 
and I didn't realize they were off. I don't even, didn't even pay attention to the um light bill. I don't know, but they were off. And I said, I, I'll be all right. That was a Wednesday. That was a Wednesday. And I said, it's all right. I get paid on Friday. I'll, I'll pay it then. I didn't care. I was going to be all right. And my mother just happened to stop by my house. And she's like, your light's off? I'm like, yeah, that, I'll be all right. I get paid tomorrow, whatever, and I'll get back on. So the next morning, next day, my lights are back on because my mother went and paid the bill, all right? And so when when you make a law that requires people, when there's a legalistic um, taint to your salvation and it requires money, you're going to leave some people out. So now, if getting to heaven, I mean, I had to buy a particular tie or shirt, well, as you can see, I couldn't even pay my light bill. So how could I have bought a shirt or a tie to get to heaven? I can't do it. Don't don't add anything to salvation. Salvation by grace is just salvation by grace. It, you don't have to come to church on time. You ain't got to give no offerings. You got to work on the usher board or sing in the choir. You have to do none of that. None of those things do you have to do for salvation. Understand me now. Don't before you go to running, pastor say, I ain't got to come to church on time. I don't have to no, I'm not saying that. None of those things count for your salvation. Should you be to church on time? Please. The rest of us are there. You should be there too. Should you give? You should. For the upbuilding of the kingdom, for the work of the ministry, because it takes money. Jesus had to pay taxes. So what makes you think that you can come and uh, like somebody said, that you might give five dollars, you know, consistently. And of course, if that's all you have, that's what you should give. But if you got hundreds of thousands of dollars and you come and drop off five, ten dollars, don't think that you're doing anything. We appreciate it, but the chairs you're sitting in cost more than ten dollars. So guess what? Somebody had to pay that. Somebody had to give it when you didn't give. So since you don't want to come to church and sit on the floor, then you got to give something so we can provide seats for you to sit in. And you don't want to be hot in the summertime or cold in the winter. So you got to give so we can pay those bills and et cetera, et cetera. So, but never let it be said, if you don't give, well, you ain't saved. Well, that's not true. That's not true at all. It's not true. I could, I could say, and, and we could get into this, maybe you're not listening to, to the spirit of God in you. If you don't give, you're not listening when the spirit is telling you to love somebody, you don't love them. All right. That's a whole different ball game. But Paul said, you ran well, you were running well, you were doing fine. You were doing fine. And now all of a sudden you tripped up because you, you're adding things, you're adding baggage and you're making salvation heavy and it shouldn't be heavy. Oh Lord, I felt something like that. All right. Verse eight, this persuasion come not cometh not of him that called you. No, 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 no. Um, that's not the Lord calling you to a different place, calling you higher. And I cannot reiterate this enough that what God wants from us, what the father wants from us is us. So he can live with us and fellowship with us. Jesus says in John chapter, is it 15? I am the vine. Ye are the branches. My father is the husband. It sounds like a 16, it's 17. Sound like a 17. He says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, hmm? what is the father seeking for those to worship him in spirit and truth? He just wants fellowship with us. He said to Moses, tell Pharaoh to let my people go so that they may come and worship me. I want them out of Egypt, out of the distractions, out of the bondages, out of the weights, out of the, I don't know, feelings of inadequacy or feelings of hatred, whatever it is. I want them in a place where they can see what I have provided for them. And I want them to worship me. And, and I, I cannot keep you from running the gamut of your thoughts but is God does not give us so we can worship him. He gives us because he cares for us. He gives us because we love him. 
So it's not about, well, I'll give you a Cadillac if you worship me. It's never that. If he gives you a Cadillac, Mercedes, Bugatti, whatever you want, he, if he gives you that, it's because he loves you. And so he said, I provided for Israel because I love them. And in turn, I hope they will love me and worship me and worship me only. You never have to tell someone. You do not have to tell. I have been, um, I, I guess I've been taught to bathe. I've, I've been taught to be clean. I don't like the smell of not clean. So you never have to tell me I got to bathe. But if I don't know what clean smells like, then you have to come and tell me you need to bathe. So when I think about the law and God says, thou shalt have no other gods before me, that's because they had other gods. If, if there was, if there were no gods crowding out his space, so to speak, he would have never said that. Well, what do you want from us? Tell him to tell us what he wants and we'll do it. Don't have any other gods before me. Oh, these little things. Yeah. He pointed out to them, this is what you're doing that grieves me, but it also hurts you because you can't see me with all these other things. Okay. All right. Um, so verse nine says a little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. He says, be careful because when you start adding stuff, now you're going to mess up the whole cake. I threw that in there. A little leaven, all right? A little yeast, a little sugar, anything that's going to ferment, all right? Those of you who bake, those of you who don't bake, but you've seen bread being baked, they put the bread, they roll it up, boom, and then it starts to rise. He says, if you add stuff, sprinkle it in there, then you're going to start to rise. You're going to mess up the unleavened bread. You're going to mess up your understanding and your acceptance of the righteousness of God by faith. There are people who for years are confused because they've been taught in church innocently, innocently. You got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to do the other. And so they miss salvation because they never understand it's just by faith. Again, when I was growing up, oh, you can't listen to this. You can't wear that. You can't do this and be saved. So at some point we were miserable because the things that were available to us, they were not sin, but they were part of the legalism that had crept into our faith or tried to creep into our faith. You know how I know? Because they would say, they would preach very hard and all that other stuff. And I still slip and listen and love it and was good at it. Could play it. I'm listening. Oh. I, there was a time in my life, I don't know what this was about, but I was being invited everywhere to sing. I was being invited to the, the, um, the Rotary Clubs and the Ladies Garden Club. I don't know why, but I was invited to all those places to sing. And what what could I sing? I sing Bear Manilow. Um, what's his name? I see him his face. I can't call his name now, but I love Bear Manilow. I sang him. I sang um, not Freddie Prince, not Freddie Frederick. What is his name? I don't know. Um, I believe the children are future. What's his name for the guitar? Anyway, saying that, um, uh, one in a million, who's a Larry Graham? This is stuff that came easy to me. So if I sang that, I'm not saved. That's legalism because the scripture says, if you believe. And so at some point, I just said, you know what? They're not going to know. I'm just going to play it at home. And uh, when I get to church, I'll sing church music. Oh, you're a hypocrite. I'm not. That is just being legalistic. So a lot of people miss the revival because they say, I gotta you gotta give up this and you gotta give up that. And they were like, I don't want to give it up. And again, when you're in sin, 
or you're not walking by faith, whatever you're doing, of course, you're not going to want to give it up. And that's okay. That's human nature. Hmm? Um, I've seen on TV, anyway, people in traumatic situations, uh, you know, and I can't say specifically, but, you know, let's say somebody got shot or there was, you know, bombs and stuff going on. And um, so they grabbed a hold of something, uh, I don't know, a chair or whatever, 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 all right? Or maybe they was in the, fell in the water and they grabbed hold of something and that's what saved their life. So when they are rescued, so to speak, and they need medical attention, they don't want to let that thing go because just a little while ago, it was life and death. And this seemed to be the thing that kept me alive. So now you're safe and we need to tend to your wounds. We need to help you live give us this and they don't want to give it up because they are afraid. Okay. And that's the same thing with coming to Christ. We're holding on to things because they are, they are familiar and it's natural to hold on to what's familiar, but we just got to distinguish between what we need to let go, how we need to let it go, when we need to let it go and trusting in God. I can trust God and still Listen to Barry Manilow. I don't like it more of it either. I can listen to Barry Manilow. Hey, I love this little, you know, bead neck. I love this. Not 40 years ago when I was growing up, that sin. And, you know, women couldn't wear makeup. They couldn't wear pants. And they had scriptures for it. And I, and I love this because I heard uh, Jake's talking about the money changes. Jesus did not turn over tables because they were selling chicken dinners and i don't know where people get that from i remember johnny washington used to preach that thing so dogmatically jesus kicked the money chains out of the church not because they were selling chicken dinners and i know i've told you this it was because they were cheating the people you got to bring a lamb to um to sacrifice for your sin this is the time you got to come you got to bring this offering so you walk all this way with this little lamb, you know, a hundred miles or so, something for some. You walk all this way, some, and they probably carried it. Some, a lamb without spot, without blemish. He was perfect when he left home. They, you get to the temple. Oh, something's wrong with your lamb. You got to buy one of ours. Oh, we don't use your money. You got to buy our money. And so they were stealing from the people, and as Jake's put it. Um, they were selling the sacrifices. And you can't buy the sacrifice. It has to, it has to die willingly. It has to be, um, how can I put it? Um, it has to be, I don't want to say unwill. What about, I don't know what word I'm looking for. But, but no, you're not raising it to be a sacrifice. It just is a sacrifice. And they were selling sacrifices. So, and I never thought about this. The first temple that was built was Solomon's temple. The second temple was Herod's temple. So now their faith was being sold and bought and controlled by Herod, not in honor of God. But Herod was making a profit. So that's why Jesus turned those tables over. Okay. So you can sell chicken dinners from now on. All right. Um, but we put a legalistic spin on just believing and people have missed the revival. Like I said, because they don't want to give this up or they don't know how to give it up or they'll say, you know, so-and-so got saved and they backslid. So I'm not coming till I I'm sure I got inside of my system. I'm not coming till I'm sure I'm going to be saved and you will never come because it's never about you. It's about what he did for us. Last thing, let me move on. I remember somebody saying that, you know, you want to be saved. Jesus not coming down to where you are. You got to come up to where he is. And I'm thinking, wow. When I heard that, I was like, I'm glad I'm saved already because I don't know if I can get up there. But, again, that's our legalism. And I want to be generous. So we were, uh, we were, um, Unknown caller. we were, legitimately ignorant 
And so now we're thinking, I got to get up to where Jesus is because he ain't coming down to where I am. But David said he picked me up out of the muck and the miry clay. Hmm? He picked me up. All right, let me get on. All right, verse 10. He says, I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he may be. I trust that I preached a solid gospel, that I preached a solid faith, and that you are not going to be swayed by these other people, these sensationalisms. You got to be careful. You will never learn God by your intellect. You will only learn him by him revealing himself to you. And he reveals himself not by the boxes you check off, but by you submitting yourself to him and say, Lord, I want your righteousness. That's how you receive him. It's by faith. It is never, 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 never. By the legalistic rituals that we place on people. I was talking to somebody, where they were going on about, um, you got to wear this for this occasion and wear that for that occasion. It looks nice. It does. But there are some places if you don't come, and I ain't talking about one denomination, I know at least two, maybe three. If you don't come to a particular service and you don't have on white or this or that, they won't let you in. You can't be a part of this service if you don't have on this. But anyway, all right. Um, Paul says in verse 12, I would even, they were cut off from you, which trouble you. Yes, I do too. All right. Verse 13, for brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Hmm? Only use not your liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Okay. Um, And I can come back to this. I can come back to this because I don't want to um, get deep in that. Like I say, I, we can do more extensive study of Galatians than we will. All right. So we have freedom from the law. But it does not mean you can just do anything you want to do. So he says, we have liberty, but don't use it as an occasion to the flesh. So in the church of God, when I was growing up, we had practical commitments and we had spiritual commitments. So the practical commitment said we wouldn't do things like drink alcohol, smoke cigarettes. I don't think they said cigarettes, but no alcohol and don't go to the dance hall. Men and women ought to swim separately. All these kind of things. These are practical commitments, meaning that there was a moral standard that we all should have. And we, the founders felt that through the spirit of God, they would teach us and lead us even in these moral obligations. Okay. So we're not to just live because, oh, I'm saved. I can do this. I can do that. But the, but the heartbeat, the pulse of the people of God is love. We're living and we're reaching and we're serving our lifestyle is one of love. So my interactions with you, my dealings with you, my doing for you must be all in love. Not, not to, um, not to, to put myself on a pedestal. Oh, you know, I've done this and I've done that and I'm this, I'm that. no, but the Bible says, Jesus says, if you want to be great, you got to be a servant. You want to go high, you got to go low. Why? Because to be like him, we got to be meek and lowly. Isaiah 53, as a lamb before its shearers is dumb, he opened, so he opened not his mouth. How they put in the Baptist church, he never said a mumbling word. I don't know what a mumbling word is, but he didn't say a mumbling one. All right? So this love comes out of the Holy Spirit. It's a fruit that we should bear. Notice that uh, when we get to Galatians, the end of Galatians, it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Nothing that nothing that we have to do, no effort of our own. 
the fruit of the spirit. The spirit dwells in us, then the fruit will be produced in us. If the spirit is a part of our lives, then that fruit will begin to blossom. It will begin to uh, produce. There'll be a harvest. You know, just like, if, listen, if you got an orange tree and you don't pick those oranges, they're going to fall off. This fruit should fall off of us. People should know that. We'll know that we're Christians by our love, not by the things we say, not by the things we wear, not how often we go to church. We are Christians by our love. Now, understand, as long as we're human, we're going to always try to take advantage of the situation. So I'm going to love you, but I don't have to let you take advantage of me. That's not love. That's manipulation. All right. But my loyalty is to him who saved me, who pulled me out of the fire, who gave his life for me. That's what my loyalty is. And I know we heard a lot of sermons this week about Jesus going into um, Jerusalem, Hosanna, Hosanna. And then by the end of the week, they're saying crucify him. And I was going to preach Sunday, but I couldn't get there. Everybody needs a Judas. So I'm going to preach it this Sunday. But we all need a Judas. We need one. You say, why do we need a Judas? Well, I'll tell you on Sunday. I can't tell you now. Then I'd have nothing else to preach. But I'm going to pause right there and get ready for, well, I got a few more minutes. I don't have a few more minutes. All right. Um, let me read this. Paul said that freedom obligated to them to serve one another through love. That's verse 13 for brethren. Ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty as an occasion for the flesh. You can't walk all over people your way or no way. And it really bothers me in church when people saying, well, you know, I run this and, you know, I tell the pastor what to do and blah, blah, blah. Why are you coming to church for that? Stay home. Let us come and worship God. We're not here to worship you. You got to do such and so on. You got to talk to brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so. Where the money at? So-and-so got the money. So I mean, All that stuff? Uh-uh. No, 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 no. Where does love originate? It is the fruit of the Spirit. Okay? Something that the law could not do. You could say, don't covet your neighbor's wife, but that doesn't mean you love your neighbor. You're afraid of the law. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Don't do any work on the Sabbath. Not because you love the Sabbath, you were afraid of the law. You didn't love God enough to just rest. You were afraid of the law. Thou shall not kill. Not because you didn't want to. You were afraid of the law. That's bondage. All right. All right. Non-Christians cannot replicate such love because they lack the spirit. You need the law to love some of these people. I got three right now. I need him to love them. Hmm? We're dominated by the sinful nature and receive no help from the law. That's why they had burnt offerings, because they kept breaking the law. Hello? I don't hear nobody. All right. Destructive conduct characterizes the relationships of those who are bound by the law. And so Paul was trying to say this. There is no strength. It's futile to live by the law because it does not produce fruit from you. Huh? Could not save, nor could it lead one to grow in love and holiness. If the law was all of that good for those that really want to follow it, then the next year you would be better at. You would bring fewer sacrifices, but that never happened. Every time you went to the temple, you know, certainly once a year, everybody came. But, you know, every week. You stop by your local priest anyway, or however it was, to do a trespass. Trespass, if the law was making me perfect, I wouldn't have to do a trespass offering. Mm. Well, I'm going to leave it there, and we'll finish this off next week. It's always great to be in Bible study with you, and it looks like the time just flies by, and I don't have enough time. Pray for us. I'm praying for you. There are um, 
prayer requests, please send them in. Please send them in. Talk to us. Put them in the chat so we can pray for you and your loved ones. All right. The Lord bless you and keep you. Have a wonderful and safe Easter weekend. I will see you on Sunday. I think we got an Easter egg hunt coming. I love eggs, so find me a lot of them. But um, we'll see you on the broadcast on Sunday. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you is my prayer.